Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you very much, Jean-Paul, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to uh, present something here. So I was asked to give an introduction, and I was not asked to give solutions, so I will avoid giving solutions. I will talk about problems. But if you are interested in solutions, I mean, there are some talks and posters related to what I talk about and then address, please, the people uh, who have the solutions. So uh, it's actually not the problem or um, the topic of the background approach to the FRG or, in general, the background approach. But what we are after is to discuss background independence, which is very crucial in quantum gravity. But of course, you also have this problem around in other theories if you then introduce, because there it's a luxury, uh, a background field. But in gravity, I hope I can convince you, I mean, it's not a luxury, it's just built into the uh, theory. So um, I will talk about this from the perspective of uh, the FRG, because we have a FRG conference here. But of course, there are also many other approaches where you can discuss background independence of quantum field theories. And I can already, because I know his slides, uh, point to the talk of Daniel Becker. He has a very nice uh, physical introdu physics introduction uh, to this uh, setting uh, in his transparencies. So if you're not satisfied with my technical introduction, which may not be pedagogical, um, uh, please wait for the talk of Daniel. So um, I think I don't have to explain uh, the setting here. So we want to solve a quantum field theory. We use the flow equation. And the flow equation is an equation for the effective action, which depends on the mean field, so the expectation value of the field. So let's assume we have one field or several fields. It could be a super field. But now we try to solve this theory with an expansion about some background. So for the time being, you can just think about a simple scalar field theory. Let's take the easing model. There you would have a real scalar field. And just for some reason, I will explain some of the reasons you could have, I want to split the full field into a background and then a fluctuation field which I integrate out. Okay, So this means I have an ex expansion of the effective action. So I have my effective action here at scale dependent and it depends on the full field, phi. But now I split it in phi bar plus phi and I expand it. So I get the effective action of the mean field, so of my uh, background field. And then I have just the expansion coefficients here, which are just the correlation functions, and they are here the 1PI correlation function in this given background. Okay? And just notation-wise, uh, the derivatives here are just those with respect to the fluctuation field. And of course, you can also take derivatives with respect to the background field, and then you get these mixed uh, derivatives. Right? And of course, in, in the general context, I'm not talking about gravity at the moment, you do this in order to facilitate the computation. Right? Maybe you have some information about the background, I mean, about the physical background, and then you expand your free energy or effective action about this background. Okay? So as I said, you could take a solution of the equations of motion, you could take some topological configuration or defect because you think uh, these configurations are important for the physics uh, you discuss. That might not be a solution to the equations of motion. Or you just have a non-trivial numerical problem and you just take a background which simplifies your numerics. So yes, there are several physics and technical reasons to choose a background. But as I said here, take a scalar theory so it's your luxury. You just do this in order to get better results or to improve your conversions, whatever, but it's still luxury. Okay, so now, uh, because you start, with, you start with an effective action, which is just depending on the sum of these two fields, you have, because of translation invariance and shifts in the field, you have a non-trivial identity, namely, well, here it's trivial, derivatives with respect to the background, are just derivatives with respect to the fluctuation. Okay? And then you can just work out relations for the correlation functions because at the very end what we usually do in our approach is we work out relations for the correlation functions and then these correlation functions satisfy the following identity. I take the nth correlation function, so that's the nth derivative with respect to the fluctuation field. I take one derivative with respect to the background 
and it's the n plus first derivative with respect to the fluctuation field, which again comes from the fact that I have just an effective action which depends on one field. Okay? That tells you that your effective action, which you write down in two fields, depends only on one field. Okay? And if you make an approximation to the flow equation, maybe this identity is not satisfied, even though it was so trivial. Right? Now, this will be called, in the more, let's say, intricate uh, context of gauge theories or gravity, this is the split ward identity or the Nielsen identity and also is related to the modified of taylor identities which we have in water, uh, which we have in gauge theories. Now, if you put in a regulator which itself depends on the background field, then this identity is broken. Because you put in a function which only depends on the background, then of course this translation invariance is broken and you get cutoff dependent terms here. And then this is a modified split water identity and a modified Nielsen identity, such as we discuss modified of taylor identities in gauge theories, and there's a tight relation. So that is a setup. I mean, this is a trivial example, but these are the equations we will deal with. And as I said here, I mean, choosing a background is a luxury. We do it for technical or physical reasons. But of course, physics will not depend on the choice of the background. Right? That is the background independence on this very trivial level we are discussing. Okay. So, I think I have said a bit some technical terms and explained um, what we mean with background independence. And if this was too technical, please wait for Daniel. Okay. Let's go to gravity. Okay. Then so the phi is just the metric field. We may have other fields if we have meta content. So, let's write down the Wetterich equation for pure gravity. Nobody complains, but you should complain. Of course, this is not working. This would be great. We would have one field. Everything is nice. So background independence is no problem. Of course, the second derivative of gamma with respect to the metric has zero directions. We have a gauge theory. We have dysmorphism invariance. So we have to gauge fix. Okay? So we do a gauge fixing. And since there are also diffeomorphism invariant approaches, I will also later, if I have time, say something why, in my opinion, uh, they are as good as gauge fixing. Okay, I mean, I have to put in some provocative statements any, every now and then, otherwise we won't have a discussion, so that's my first one. Okay, so we put a gauge fixing here. I took a linear gauge fixing. There are other gauge fixing. I'm very uh, general here. So you have some function, some gauge fixing function, so some operator applied to the metric field. You square it, so you do the standard thing, you know, from quantum electrodynamics or QCD or whatever in a gauge theory. So if you put alpha to zero, you have a sharp implementation of the gauge fixing. If alpha is not zero, you just average over um, gauge fixing conditions. Okay? Um, now, uh, you see already here, if this gauge fixing should be quadratic in the gauge field, so the gauge fixing term, you have to choose a background metric in gravity. You can't avoid this. Okay? You can say, well, why not, why not drop this term here, square root g bar? And I don't have, need the dependence on square root g bar here in the gauge fixing condition. Yeah, but then you choose a flat background. So it's unavoidable in gravity if you gauge fix that you have a background. And since I said, I mean, what about gauge fixing and gauge or different physical invariant approaches, Gauge fixing means I choose a coordinate system in my configuration space. And I have not seen any computation in the flow equation or otherwise which does not choose a coordinate system. So if you choose a coordinate system, it's as good as uh, choosing a gauge. So even different uh, physical invariants or gauge invariant formulations, in some implicit sense, choose a gauge. Okay. So now uh, we are in business. So now we can invert <coughs> the second derivative with respect to the fields of the effective action. We have now a split. So you have to, we, we needed to introduce a background. So we expand about this background. This is a linear split. Right? So we have a fluctuation field, as I explained before. And the derivative here in the flow equation is that with respect to the fluctuations. It's not that with respect to the background. Okay. Um, of course, we have now 
an upgrade of this trivial identity I've showed you before. I drop, if you wish, explicit expressions for the non-trivial terms. So this would be the standard identity. You take the derivative of the H, and it's just the derivative with respect to the G bar, and then there are terms which come from the gauge fixing, which now also introduces a difference between the background and the fluctuation field, and in our approach, of course, also inevitably, there are terms which depend on the cutoff function. In gravity, again, I mean, even if you choose a flat background in your cutoff function, it means you choose a background. So also, RK will depend on this background. Okay, so you have these two terms. Okay. So you have a non-trivial identity now to solve. And in a gauge theory, this non-trivial identity, which tells you that fluctuation derivatives are related to background derivatives, also encodes the non-trivial BST symmetries or gauge symmetries in gravity diffeomorphism symmetry of your theory. So it's a highly non-trivial uh, identity. It correlates, it relates fluctuation correlation functions and background correlation functions. The background correlation functions have diffeomorphism invariance or covariance, but the fluctuation ones don't have this. They have non-trivial symmetry identities, the slavnov taylor identities. And going from the trivial symmetry correlation functions to the non-trivial one is encoded in this identity here. So the L term encodes the non-trivial implementation of gauge or diffeomorphism symmetry for the fluctuation fields. Okay, but nevertheless, what this identity tells you, it's the same as before. At the very end, we only have one field. So it encodes the background field invariance or independence of gravity. So that's the equation, if you wish, which we have to solve. Okay, so of course now what you can do is you say, okay, I mean the regulator dependence, fair enough. If I put the regulator to zero, I mean it's gone, so let's drop the regulator terms in this non-trivial identity as a first approximation because at the very end we have to compute something. Right, and it's getting a bit difficult to solve these equations. And then we go on, since this was a nice argument, we say, okay, let's drop also the L terms. Right, it's gauge fixing terms. I mean, the physics is in the gauge invariant or different physical invariant part, so let's drop also those. Okay? Then you, you are back at the trivial identity, right, which tells you that the theory, if you solve this in this, in this approximation, is a, is a function of the background field plus the fluctuation field. And that's the background approximation, and it works very well. However, I mean, now we are in a state, since in gravity, I would say since five years, where we overcome the background approximation. So now I can speak loudly about, I mean, what is the problem with the background approximation and why you should be really careful. Okay, so now let's look at the Wetterich equation in the background approximation. You have one field, it's simple. So you have a field of one background field, and here, it's just the second derivative with respect to the background field because the second derivative with respect to the fluctuation field and the background field degree. Very simple equation. Background independence seemingly is restored in this approximation. I say seemingly because I try to convince you now that this is not the case. Okay. So, it looks like a simple equation. You have one field, but now the dynamical field and the background field are identical, and the cutoff function depends on the dynamical field. It depends, of course, on the background field. I mean, you cannot put the dynamical field in the cutoff, but now you mix them up, so it depends on the dynamical field. So you put in dynamics via your cutoff function into your theory. So let's see what you can do. Okay, now I make a regulator bootstrap. And since Daniel warned me already, I'm not saying that you should do this. I'm saying, telling this because you fail if you do this. So now, a very simple cutoff function is the following. You take the regulator to be proportional to gamma 2. Because the only non-trivial operator which comes from physics is gamma 2, so maybe we can get rid of it. Okay? And then there is some cutoff function, little r, it's dimensionless, and you can choose it whatever. Okay? I, I leave it free at the moment. Now let's look at the, cut, uh, let's look at the, um, the flow equation now you have one term which does not depend on gamma 2. It's one loop exact. You can immediately integrate it, and it gives you a one loop effective action. Okay? And then there's another term where you have here, the, let's say, the infrared regularization. That's the R over 1 plus R 
I mean, it gives you an ultraviolet finite and infrared finite uh, flow. And then there's something you could interpret as a generalized anomalous dimension. So it's a, it's a um, functional anomalous dimension. Now you have a representation now because of your cutoff choice in this approximation where all the non-trivial physics is in the anomalous dimension. I think it won't work in general. Okay? But I mean, if you're not convinced, let's go on. Now I do the following. Because I have this large freedom in the cutoff function, I like my flow. Now I call the right-hand side of the flow equation f. And I choose my f as at wish. And I try to find a regulator which gives you this flow. And I can ensure you I have played around with this. And you see here, I mean, this is referring to uh, work with Daniel Littem. And there's a one in gravity with uh, Sarah Volkertz. Uh, master student at the time in Heidelberg, uh, you can do quite a lot. So if you give me, you want to have some flow in some theory which has a certain form, give it to me, I give you the cutoff function which produces this. So now you should be alarmed because I'm telling you, you give me a theory, you want to have something coming out and I, I can produce it. Okay? And how, why this is so, I mean, it, you cannot find solutions to this differential equation for any f, but for quite a large variety. Why is this so? Well, I mean, we have identified the fluctuation field with the background field, which means we are bringing in additional physics via the regulator. Right? And, of course, we shouldn't do this. Okay. So, if you're still not convinced, I will present an example. Um, and I know I'm, I'm in the uh, asymptotic safety community. I think I'm loved for this. I like to make uh, QCD examples. And as examples go, they never really work. Right? So you should be very careful to, to bring the in information from one theory to the other. But nevertheless, I will go ahead with this example. And this is, again, work with Daniel from 2002. You go to young Mills theory. There's a universal beta function because you're in a critical dimension, four dimensions. You're in a critical dimension of the theory. So the one loop beta function in Young-Mills theory is as universal as it gets. You, cannot, you can do everything you want with your regularization scheme. It always comes out the same. The two loop beta function, which is also universal, where you need mass independent schemes. But with the one loop uh, beta function in a massless theory like Young-Mills theory, there's no way that you can change it. And since I say this, I will now tell you how to change it. I go to the background approximation. I take a regulator, a class of regulators, which again is proportional to the covariant derivative. I'm doing a one-loop thing, so the second derivative of the effective action is just the Laplacian with some spin term. So it's minus the covariant derivative squared plus spin uh, contributions, for example, for the spin one for the gauge field, the spin contribution is just, just sigma mu nu times f mu nu. Um, oh, sorry, it's proportional to f mu nu. So, and then I allow for a regulator function here, which is infrared divergence. There's nothing bad about infrared divergent uh, regulator functions. They just make your infrared suppression even stronger. Okay, you compute the one-loop beta function in this background approximation. That's the result. So, I have uh, written it the way there. You see, here's the universal result. And then you see that, I mean, depending on which uh, divergence you choose here in the infrared, you change it. That's not good. Now, you can use the split water identity in order to distinguish the field dependence which comes from the background uh, dependence of the regulator term. You see, I mean, this is now background dependent. And the one which comes from really the dynamics of the field. And you can cancel these terms and you get this correct one loop beta function. If you would straight away look at the fluctuation correlation functions, of course, you, for all cutoffs, give, get the correct one loop beta function. So this term comes only because I identify dynamical fields in the uh, background fields in the cutoff with dynamical fields. Right? So in Young Mills, you have to choose an infrared divergent regulator because this implicitly, implicitly brings in an additional scale. In gravity, we have this additional scale because the Newton constant is already scale-dependent quantity, so you expect this also for uh, convergent cutoff functions. So again, alarming thing. 
Okay, but background days are over, right? So we have fluctuation approaches, so we can now very well distinguish between fluctuation fields and background fields in gravity and also in other approaches. And I think this is one of the topics here of uh, the remaining talks, to show what are the, the ways to overcome this problem. I will now also very, at the very end of my talk briefly say what we are doing, but let's first of all go on. Okay, so I, I hope I have convinced you that background independence has to do something with the fact to distinguish between the fluctuation field and the background field, in particular the one you introduce via the cutoff function, carefully. Okay, so now you have the approach. You have a fluctuation field H bar, a background field G bar, and now I also, uh, let's say, improve or allow, uh, allow for an improved setting. There's a geometrical approach which is gauge invariant. So then even the, uh, or diffeomorphism invariance, then even the correlation functions of the fluctuation fields are actually diffeomorphism invariant. But what you buy with this, and that's in all the, um, uh, the gauge or diffeomorphism invariant approach is the case you buy a sort of non-locality. And we will come to this later, because there you have to ver be very careful. There's no free lunch. Whatever you do, there's a lower bound for um, problems. Okay, you make your expansion, and then I hope I have convinced you the, um, there will be non-trivial identities which are satisfied by the fluctuation correlation functions. Right, and those guys you have to take into account. Okay? And on top of this, because they have non-trivial uh, uh, dependencies on the, well, when they, they satisfy the non-trivial slough of Taylor identities, there is nothing like a gauge invariant approximation to the effective action in terms of the fluctuation field. It simply does not exist. It's not bad. We know this from QCD and other gauge theories. The effective action is just given by the set of correlation functions. And if you, want to introduce, if you want to extract physics, the best is to go to the zeroth order correlation function, which is the effective action of the background field. That one is straight away diffeomorphism invariance. And for example, in QCD, you can show that this is directly related to scattering elements of the S matrix. Okay? So at the very end, we are interested in this. But in order to compute this, we need all these guys. And they have non-trivial identities. Okay, I made this joke already um, in Stockholm one and a half years ago, and my number of jokes is limited, so I make it again. So um, those Italians here in the audience certainly can translate it to you if, you, if, you, if your Italian is not that good. Um, so what we want to have is this guy here, which is background independent. This correlation functions, the zero orders correlation function, I hope I have convinced you, stores the background independent information. So if you change, if you wish the background here, nothing will change. Okay? And the other things, if you change the background, so the other correlation functions, the fluctuation, fluctuation correlation functions, which are those on the right hand side of the flow equation, so those in the diagrams, they change with the background. Okay? So you have one thing which shouldn't be background dependent in a sense that the, uh, the equations of motion you get from this and the correlation functions are background independent, but those guys are. Okay? So I, I uh, nevertheless now give you the English translation. I find it a bit boring. I even like the uh, German more. So if you want things to stay as they are, things have to change. So if you want to have background independence for this guy here, those should be background dependent. You shouldn't even look for a truncation where they are not. Because then you break, by having something which is background independence, you break background independence. Okay, so it's a bit convoluted, but I think it's correct. Okay, so now we have our effective action. Um, we look for expansion schemes, and I again mention there is no diffeomorphism invariant expansion scheme. Part of the effective action, if you look at the meta part, there actually, we know also from QCD that you can expand in gauge invariant or BST invariant objects, but for the uh, quantum gravity part, pure quantum gravity part, there is nothing like this. 
because the correlation functions satisfy non-trivial identities, it's very difficult to write something down in a closed form which satisfies these identities. Okay, again, what is at stake? Well, if you identify, or if you use background, if you use diffeomorphism invariant truncations, I go again to QCD, there we know that the background correlation function has a trivial scaling. It, it scales like P squared. So the propagator is 1 over P squared. It looks like a QED propagator. I'm now talking about Landau gauge, but that applies to essentially all linear gauges. Uh, the fluctuation propagator actually shows the mass gap of QCD. So it is a non-trivial correlation function. And if you don't have this mass gap in the correlation function, you won't find confinement. Better, very accurately said, you lose the confining property of the order parameter of QCD. You don't want to work in this approximation in QCD. It's, again, hard to translate this in gravity, but this is essentially the last warning sign I give you. And I'm finished. So resolving these differences is getting, if you wish, less and less important, the less important your power counting for the operators is. So it's very important to resolve the difference between the fluctuation field and the background field for the cosmological constant versus the graviton mass parameter, and then it goes on. I mean, the ordering here is, of course, my liking. I cannot prove anything here. I can only tell you, please be careful. Okay, does it matter? Yes, it matters. We have examples by now in metagravity systems where the sign of diagrams is different if you look at uh, the uh, background correlation functions and the fluctuation correlation functions. Okay, so the rest was what I was supposed to talk about, but I knew already that I wouldn't have time. And I come to the conclusion. Um, so I hope I have convinced you that we get background independence in a general setting from background dependence. And this is crucial for me. So if you try to make a shortcut here, you potentially will fail. I'm not saying you fail, but you have to argue a lot. Um, the flows for the fluctuation field, which do not involve any correlation functions of the background field, are closed. So you can work out the flow equation system for the fluctuation fields for the gamma 0n I've showed you, and then on top of these flows, compute the flow of the background field. So that's how you should do it. Momentum locality I have not talked about. That's actually even related to also the locality aspects I showed, and of course applications, not only in our framework, where we make a vertex expansion about flat, but now also curved background, um, of course, are plenty. Okay, thank you. <laughs>